Hello everyone, I'm Matthew Taylor, I'm the RSA's Chief Executive, and it's my enormous pleasure to welcome today's guest, Jonathan Haidt. Jonathan is a social psychologist who studies how our moral and political institutions are formed. He's regularly cited as one of the world's most influential public thinkers. He's currently Professor of Ethical Leadership at NYU Stern School of Business. Um, Jonathan, you've been at the RSA before, so I'm say welcome back, even though I'm not welcoming you back to our wonderful uh, headquarters. Well, this when is we about the best we can do. <laughs> yes. Uh, when we last spoke, it was in 2018, and it was for the RSA's Polarised podcast series. And at the time, it felt like we had never been more politically and culturally divided. I think I remember you saying that even if Martians were to come down to Earth, uh, we'd struggle to unite against the common enemy. So here we are in 2020. We have that common enemy. It hasn't come from space. Uh, we don't know quite where it has come from. That's a matter of controversy and division in itself. But uh, how are we doing at uniting against a common enemy this time? Yeah, well, um, if you'd asked me that a few weeks ago, I would have said uh, reasonably well. Um, I think things are changing a, a bit now as, as we go through this. Um, so just to go back in time, at least in the United States, we've been seeing rising levels of political polarization which especially means cross-party hatred. And things were much better in Britain than in America for a long time, although then you went through Brexit, which was, of course, incredibly painful and, and, and divisive. Um, when I spoke uh, in uh, 2018 at the RSA, uh, it really felt like there's something about Anglo-American democracy and capitalism, which had been th these incredibly successful formulations uh, for such a long time, is that we were all going through these problems of democracy together. And I was very pessimistic. I think the talk I gave at the RSA was extremely pessimistic. So based on that really low level of hope for the future, I'm a little more hopeful now. Uh, that is, um, we were on a very bad downward path. A lot of trends were very negative. And now at least things are getting shaken up. So, so there is some hope for a change, but it's very hard, very hard to predict because there's so many interacting variables. So uh, what I want to explore with you is, is the, 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 the three kind of sets of ideas I really associate with you, Jonathan, are about human psychology and what drives us and what motivates us. Um, about institutions and the nature of institutions and you know we need institutions but the, the, the kind of uh, the challenges of institutions the way in which institutions have changed and also the state of liberal democracy um, so these are all things that I hope that we can explore first of all let's talk about psychology um, I've been reading a lot recently about how human beings behave in situations of, of collective crisis. Right. And one of the things a lot of people I've been reading have, have been wanting to say is, for some reason, we have this view that human beings under crisis tend to start behaving very badly, sometimes called the veneer view of human nature, that once you crack the veneer, then, you know, it's a kind of Lord of the Flies type image. But actually, the reality is, is not that. Generally speaking, human beings under this kind of pressure do behave well. Is, is that right? Yes, although you have to be more precise about specifying the, the circumstances. So here's two things we actually know with some confidence. Um, a foreign attack is an incredibly powerful stimulus for people coming together. So that's very clear. Um, there's even research on it. Um, uh, Joe Henrik, a, a really a great anthropologist at, at Harvard, uh, was, is part of a group that did research on people who experienced war during different ages, even in their childhood, um, in Sierra Leone, in, in the country of Georgia. And what they found is that even eight or 10 years later, if you'd been through war, you were more cooperative with members of your in-group and, and you weren't more hostile to members of the out-group. So there's a lot of evidence that a foreign attack really brings people together, brings out the best in people. You, know, you can't bomb people into submission. You can't bomb London into submission. It brings people together. Conversely, a pandemic is very different. And if you look at old style pandemics, that is until the modern era, pandemics generally have torn people apart. Uh, David Brooks had a column recently where he goes through writing from different e eras of pandemics and it's horrible. And, and actually, I got a quote right here uh, from Daniel Defoe, a journal of the plague year. This was a time when everyone's private safety lay so near them that they had no room to pity the distresses of others. The danger of immediate death to ourselves took away all bonds of love, all concern for one another. So 
when you've got shortages of uh, people literally are going to die if they if the other person gets there first, um, then people do behave very badly. But this pandemic is not like that because we don't have shortages. We're not most of us are not really at risk of death, uh, and and more than ever in history, we're experiencing not just shared adversity, but shared experience. This is incredibly weird, and we're all linked together, and we're all dying to know the same questions. So I think what we're seeing is, at least at the local level and the individual level, overwhelmingly positive responses. At least in America, the extremes are filtering through the usual culture war nonsense, and they're turning it into a reason to fight. But I think most Americans, the survey research shows, still are saying that they feel more that we're all in this together than they did a few months ago. So I think we're still on the mostly good side. But as this drags on, and if there are shortages, we could see more ugliness coming out. And, and what about people's view of change and the relationship between crisis and and change? And here I think a bit about institutions, for example. We're we're doing a lot of work at the RSA, which is 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 based on a view of change. So we argue that 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 crisis is most likely to lead to change when three conditions apply: when there was demand for change and capacity for change before the crisis, so that change doesn't come from nowhere. Secondly, the crisis itself reinforces the demand in some ways prefigures different ways of doing things for afterwards and then third and critically as you emerge from crisis and people's minds are open to possibilities and perhaps more willing to make sacrifices you've got the policies and the alliances ready to take advantage of of that moment of, of, of opportunity does that chime with you and do you think that as some people think this is a crisis that could open up possibilities for change Yes, and no, I think that's that's exactly right. Not, uh, not complete, but e exactly right. One of the words I hear most in the United States is the word reset. Uh, now, I'm involved in lots of democracy reform circles and lots of groups of people that are hoping to change things. Uh, so everyone I talk to uses the word reset. Can this be our reset? How do we make this a reset? How do we make this a pivot? Um, so I think those who are change-minded are looking, uh, looking at this. There's a, a phrase in our politics, something like, uh, you should never let a good crisis go to waste. So I think your theory of change um, is correct. The one thing I would add is that there's a really important role of, of storytelling or narrative. And this is something I've been very interested in as I've been studying social media. Uh, as I said in my talk at the RSA, uh, you know, there are two really big trends that alarm me. One is the transformation of social media into uh, much more of an outrage machine between 2009 and 2012. And the other is the rising fragility and anxiety of Generation Z, or Z those born 1996 and later. Um, uh, who I think we're, we're not really preparing them for democracy. We've been overprotecting them. So those are two of the reasons I've been very, very alarmed. Um, on the social media front, um, it used to be possible for there to be a shared understanding of what was happening to us. And at least in the United States, for example, after 9-11, there was at least a shared understanding of, of the basic facts of the story. Now, there were fringe theories, but they were regarded as fringe. And it's not that we all came together and agreed, but at least the basic facts we, we agreed about. Uh, and since the 2009 to 2012 period, social media has basically shredded any common understanding. Now fringe theories can get a lot of play. It's very hard to know the truth now. Um, a metaphor that I've been using the last couple of years is that uh, the Tower of Babel fell in 20, around 2012. So when God comes down and says, let us go down and confound their language that they may not understand each other, that happened to us. So it's very hard to get a common understanding. Okay, so back to your theory of change. Um, uh, people are narrative creatures and we need a, an understanding of you know, what happened in the past. You know, Once upon a time, we were like this and things were good. Then the bad people came or the bad thing happened and here's where we are now. But if we do this, then we can make it through to the promised land or whatever. So um, we were in a state of complete incoherence before the virus. Uh, it's not that we're in coherence now, but there's a chance for new stories to take hold more than there was a few months ago. So I would just add that to your theory. You have to have a story of who we are, how ideas develop. Um, I would say you need an essential element of humility or moral humility, or I should say uh, epistemological humility. And, and you know, none of us are smart enough on our own. We need each other. We need the coffee shop, something like that. If you can tell a story that is now suddenly plausible and that is not terribly polarizing, but, but they can at least reach across the center line, then I think you, you, you're, you're, you'll be in better shape for success. So, 
one of the things that people have said this crisis might help with is another one of our psychological frailties, which is our difficulty with, long, with the long term. And oh, people yeah. have pointed out that there is an eerie similarity between the warnings that were being given to us by epidemiologists over several years about the need for us to prepare for the inevitability one day of a pandemic and the kinds of warnings that you meet from cli climate scientists um, about the future. So th that's one thought, this kind of problem we have with the long term. Another problem, something else you've written a lot about, is authority and our relationship to authority. Now, we've lost trust in our institutions and oh yeah so our institutions have lost trust in us it seems to us lost trust mm -hmm. in us in terms of telling us that difficult decisions have to be made that trade-offs have to be made do you think again that the crisis if with the right leadership and i, I say that very much aware of the fact that you're in america but with the right leadership that this crisis could a help us think more about the long term and b restore our understanding of the importance of institutions that actually work and that tell us the truth and that sometimes are paternalistic towards us for our own good? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now here, I mean, the easy thing to say is, oh, yeah, if we had good leadership, like if you could just loan us your queen for a while and let her give speeches here, uh, you know, then we'd, we'd be better. Um, and actually, OK, speaking of institutions, there is research. I forget who did it, but there is research suggesting that that constitutional monarchies are more stable than republics because, uh, uh, you know, I'm well. As I said in my talk, I think I'm a Durkheimian. I'm a I, I, I love Emil Durkheim, and he called our attention to the way that we we create social groups and communities, and it's it, it's very difficult to do. But you need all this symbolic thinking and and communal processes, and so having a figurehead who's not political is actually very conducive to stability. Um, that's one thing, but. I would go back deeper. I would go back into the long history of critique of democracy. And there were uh, some excellent critics of democracy in 1787 in Philadelphia, um, when the, uh, you know, when the Articles of Confederation were not working very well here and the American founders got together to write the Constitution, um, they were very wary of democracy. They knew that democracies tend to die by faction, by, by groups, parties, only caring about defeating the other side, they don't care about the common good anymore. So you read Federalist Number 10 and you think, my God, it's like they know us today. It's like they've been reading our newspapers today. So democracy has, this, has many known problems. One is factionalism. Another one is uh, short-sightedness. Um, I heard a political scientist, I think it was Nolan McCarty, uh, on a call the other day saying that there's research that politicians are not rewarded for spending money to prepare for the future. So if, if there's been a flood and people's farms are wrecked, oh yeah, apportion money, you know, we're caring for you. That's great, we love it. But wait, you wanna spend money on the like one in 10 chance, one in a hundred chance of the levy breaking? No, that, you know, so democracies are known to be very short-sighted. Uh, this is not a problem we're going to fix with education. I think this is a problem that you can only fix with institutions and policies. Uh, and so I don't know the history we had in the United States. I think under Obama, they put in like an, uh, an office of pandemic preparedness, something like that. And I believe uh, Donald Trump uh, removed funding for it when he came in. Um, but at least if you have an administrative system and state that with a broad public understanding, that the government's job is risk protection. We, we can't, you know, each of us as citizens can't prepare for pandemics or hurricanes or asteroids. That's one of the main things we need government for. So if there's a general consensus, you know what, and, and, and I really hope to God that this pandemic teaches us all over the world, democracies have problems. Um, but the federal government, the central government's job, one of them is to put in place the, the, the commitments of, of money and talent to prepare for things, most of which will never happen, but we do it anyway. So in some of the concerns that I've heard you express about what's happened on US campuses, the, the part of that has been about a fear of people in authority, about distinguishing between that which is true and that which is opinion, it, the, a kind of sense that, that of, of relativism almost a kind of fear of distinguishing between good and less good ideas at this time we've seen you know in, the, in i don't know whether you know but in the in the uk in the middle of our brexit referendum the famous quote from our politicians was that people were tired of experts yeah. 
you know, even Donald Trump has had to have experts. I mean, he's undermined them all the time, but he's still had to have experts around him. At every press conference we have every day in this country, the experts are there to lend credibility to the politicians. So do you think this crisis does something about, uh, about the kind of nature of knowledge and, and, and the importance of, of, of firmly grounded knowledge? Um, well, yes, I, I think it does. Um, but as someone who studies moral psychology, an important lesson that I've learned is, is, is don't take statements literally. This is part of the game of moral judgment is our, you know, our side takes some sentence from their side and say, this is ridiculous. Look how ridiculous it is. But if you look under the surface, if you try to understand why did he say that, what, what, was, what was he really reacting to? And as I understand it, well, the, the, the left-right divide all over the West has been transforming from, you know, it used to be, you know, capital versus labor and, and uh, you know, the welfare state and uh, um, uh, unions, things like that. It's been transforming very clearly in the UK and the US into a sort of a globalist versus nationalist dimension. The globalists tend to be in the capital cities, the university towns, they're knowledge workers like us, they benefit from knocking down all walls. The nationalists, uh, uh, David Goodhart calls them the somewheres versus the anywheres. Um, they tend to be more rural, they're more rooted, they're more parochial. Uh, so that's been the, the left-right divide. It still corresponds to that somewhat, but it's kind of a rotation. So when you see our countries polarized in that way, and you realize that almost everyone in the media, well, at least the, the media other than the right-wing media, almost everyone in the normal media and then the, you know, the more left-wing media, um, everyone is a globalist and they have contempt for the people on the right. They, they show contempt for the nationalists. And uh, uh, so now you can understand why the many people on the right feel that those experts have contempt for us. Now, if the experts were almost always right, it'd be one thing. But, you know, again, I keep returning to this theme of epistemological humility. It's incredibly difficult to find the truth, even if you're an expert. Experts often get it wrong. Now, they're much better than chance. We need to follow them. But in a polarized environment where the sort of the expert class is pretty politically homogeneous and many of them have contempt for the other side, well, anytime they make a mistake, boy, do the other, does the right jump on them. So I think you have to understand that comment from Michael Gove, and boy, do we have that here in the United States. You have to understand that as part of, as part of this growing divide between the, the sort of the, the, the more you know, rural rooted or the, the somewheres and the anywheres. And I think it is incumbent on the, on the anywheres, the, the globalists, the, 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 the elite, it's really incumbent on them to, um, to, to depoliticize, uh, to, to really try hard to avoid becoming the sort of the, the support team for one political party, and especially to stop showing contempt for those who are not on, on their team. It occurs to me that, that, that putting some of your thoughts together, Jonathan, that, 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 that one of the ways a crisis works is it holds up a mirror to us. But it holds up a, a, it holds up a mirror with different kind of facets. We can see different things in that mirror. There isn't one reality, yeah? And we can read newspapers and hear programs that will emphasize the way in which people are supporting each other and being neighborly. But we can also read stories which tell us other things. Uh, newspapers in this country, for example, yeah. have been a bit too fond of running stories about how people are ignoring the lockdown, when actually the vast majority of people yeah. are following the lockdown. Yeah. It used to be said, I can't remember the exact phrase, but, you know, bad news travels around the world in the time that it takes good news to put its boots on. Or a yeah, phrase I like think that. it was Mark Twain, but yeah. Mark Twain, exactly. So it's the same though, isn't it, with, with, with fake news in a sense. Fake news travels around the world by the time robust news has put its boots on. How do we deal with this? That, that, that what sells newspapers is telling people bad stuff about people, mm -hmm. not good stuff. The, 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 ph the phenomenon of social media that you describe. And now a whole group of politicians who seem to revel in, in division as well. How do we get out of that? And how do we try to develop a more, both a more positive, but also more realistic view of the fact that mm -hmm. basically human beings are, are reasonably good people most of the time? 
Yeah, no, that's right. Um, I think rather than holding up a mirror, I think a better metaphor is how society works is very hard to see. Think of it as an incredibly complicated machine buried in the sand. We can't really see it. And we all tell stories about it. And you know, on the right, they have one story about it. And uh, you know, on the left, they have a different story about it. There's all these stories about it, but we don't really know. And then when a crisis hits, it's like the machine starts working or we see it working and it tends to not be what anybody thought. So it's not exactly a mirror. I think it's more like we, we see things that we didn't know, but we made up stories before. And we're very good at you know, maintaining our stories if we want to. Um, so that, that's, that's the, f the first thing is, again, look at the power of narrative stories and, and, and the way that different understandings develop that can be very far removed from the facts. Uh, this, was, this has always been a problem, um, but it was more a problem once the internet came in because now you could Google anything and find anything you want. And then even more of a problem once social media came in because now people can package and put out new meanings, new understandings. How do we deal with this? Um, I think we, and again, I think I talked about this in my, in my last RSA talk, um, we, we have to understand that uh, social media in its present freeform Wild West format in which, in which outrageous lies travel much faster than, than, than truth, um, I believe is a real threat to democracy. Democracy has always been unstable. It, it's, it's not that robust. It has all these flaws. Social media amplifies those flaws. So that I think is very clear. Um, how do we improve social media and, and our engagement with it so that it supports democracy, which of course it can do. It, it can be an incredible democratizing force. How do we do that? Um, I believe that one of the most important steps we can take um, is we've, we've got to think about the, the public square. We are now migrating into a public square on social media. What kind of public square do we want? Do we want a public square where anyone can come in and stab you with pins and needles or throw acid in your face and run away laughing and you don't even know who it was? Do we want that public square? Because that's what Twitter is. That's what any format where there's an, you know, people can be anonymous, they can make ad hominem attacks, they can make racial insults, they can make death threats, nothing happens to them. That's absurd. So I think the, uh, I have an article in The Atlantic uh, last November with uh, Tobias Rose Stockwell on how social media changed. And the most important suggestion we make is that we've got to have some kind of identity verification on our most important platforms. That does not mean you have to use your real name. But you can't be, nobody should be allowed to create a hundred different fake accounts in a day and just go attacking people. I don't want that kind of public square. No democracy could live with that kind of public square. So I've been talking with some of the, Tobias and I are talking with some of the people at the major platforms trying to figure out how do you do this? How do you have some other entity that at least verifies, yes, this is a real human being who's located in some country. Okay, you pass you pass some token over to the platform. Yes, go ahead. They can create an account. Uh, it's hard to do this, but there are ways to do it while still respecting people's uh, privacy and, and even anonymity. Um, so I think we've got to take really seriously that social media in its present format, I think, is incompatible with successful democracy. And we have to do something to improve social media so that people can't, so the costs of of, of, of aggressive actions, uh, uh, death threats, rape threats. Those things have to be tro t t toned down. Uh, people should have some skin in the game for the things that they say. Let's talk, we, 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 we could just talk for so long, I'm aware of the time, but I, let's talk a bit about, about politics in the sense that one of the suggestions I made to you earlier, Jonathan, is that, is that one of the reasons that crisis can sometimes lead to intentional long-term change is that there's a coalition that, that, that is developed. And I, I contrast in that, for example, that in the AIDS epidemic, it, it felt, uh, and I lived through that, it felt at some moments early on in that, that the gay community was going to hide away and retreat and that governments might stigmatize them. Mm. And that instead what actually happened was that after a while, and it was a terror, 300,000 people died in America alone, I think, but it was a terrible, but after a while, the gay community said, no, we're going to come out and we're going to fight for our rights and we're going to be proud of ourselves. And that worked then with government officials who said, and our, our approach is going to be not to blame people, right. but to educate the public. Um, and then you come out of that crisis with changes of behavior in the gay community, with proper investment in treatment, which ultimately leads to a condition no longer being fatal. Um, and, eventually, and also you get gay and lesbian liberation on the back of that a few years later. Right? Contrast that with the global financial crisis, where for the progressive wing at the end of that, you had kind of liberal and social democratic parties exhausted, not really knowing what to do. And then you had the left in the kind of 1% movement and the Occupy movement. So what you had was 
the idealists who possibly didn't have any much practical ideas and the practical people who seemed to lack a, a way of speaking to people who felt so angry and hurt. How important do you think is it that, 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 that around the world, the kind of progressive view stretching from the center ground to a more radical left position, mm -hmm. but that, that that has become so divided and, and is yeah. a part of tackling climate change inequality, these structural issues about how we rebuild those progressive alliances? Yes. Um, the, so I think part of what's going on here is you have to look at each person who cares about a cause. Now, are they motivated to solve the problem or are they motivated to be part of the team and show how much they're part of the team? And, you know, the conclusion I came to in The Righteous Mind is that our moral reasoning is really much more about display. Uh, we want people to think well of us. Um, and so we adopt strategies that often alienate people that fail to persuade them. But we don't really care because really what we want is for people to see how passionate we are, what good team members we are. And so... Um, I, I, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of reason to be angry about a lot of issues, uh, and there's there's a lot of idealism among young people on college campuses, even in high schools now in America around gun control, uh, obviously climate uh, uh, climate change and extinction rebellion, and I, I think I would urge activists of all sorts to think, okay, um, how do we do we actually want to win here? And there are times, there are times when anger and intimidation might be effective. Um, but if you look at the times when, you, when activists have really had incredible forces against them, such as the civil rights activists in the American South, when it was literally the, government, the governor and the police department against them, um, or in South Africa with the apartheid state, uh, we see so many examples of activists who, who worked to, to, to reduce the anger or, or, and, and, and bring out feelings of love, humanization, um, and it took a while, but uh, by, by drawing a larger circle, by appealing to people, by humanizing them, there are so many examples of successful social change, whereas the instinct is just go, you know, we're angry, we're going to demonize them, and then you, the other side tends to react and get angrier too, and you be, we get a polarization spiral. Um, I think the, the gay marriage movement in the United States is a great example Early on in 2004, 2008, they were focusing on rights, demanding rights. Uh, but, it, but after they failed in a lot of referenda, they switched to talking about love um, and appealing to people's nobler, uh, nobler instincts. Um, and the commercials in 2012 were really elevating, touching, moving. Uh, so I, I, I would urge um, anyone who wants to change, I would urge you to, well, read moral psychology, read Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People, um, and then try to create that kind of movement that is not about demonization, um, but that is humble, um, that is even loving, um, and that appeals to people's nobler motives. Most people, um, you know, as you say, most people are behaving well, they're good citizens. Uh, don't be distracted by the extreme cases that the media on each side is going to emphasize to show how monstrous the other side is. Most people are pretty decent. So last question, uh, uh, Jonathan, and, and, and you know, you're, you're not a sophologist, so uh, I, maybe it's an unfair question, but um, I, I look at what's happening in America and I don't think people on the left are going to change their views and I don't think people on the right are going to change their views. And in some ways, there's, you know, as we see polarization about lockdown and all of that. Do you have a sense of what people in the middle ground will feel about this when it looks as though America is going to have pretty high figures and it's pretty clear that quite a lot of bits of the American system have not responded terribly well to this. And so, you know, when in three or four months we look at the kind of big global league table, America's not going to look great in that, in that context. It would look terrible. What do you think will be the impact on those people who are, do not have already strongly fixed ideological views? Will they say this does demonstrate that we actually need a government that believes we need leaders who believe in government, who believe that government can make a difference? We do need to invest a bit in the long term. We do need to care more about the people who fall belief between the cracks. Is, is that an unrealistic hope that that might be the lesson that people learn? Yeah, no, that is that is definitely a possibility. That is certainly what many of us who are hoping for a reset or a pivot are hoping for. And so I'll just put two 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 things on the table that that might be encouraging in that regard. Uh, first, I, I need to read about the history of the religious wars in Europe. But my very superficial understanding is that ideas of religious tolerance that were so influential on the founding of the United States. 
they didn't come about because people suddenly were elevated into being super tolerant. Is that they were exhausted and the, these wars of religion and you know Protestants and Catholics. Like okay, let's let's just stop. Uh, and so I'm hopeful that uh, that young people in the United States and and in other democracies that are having trouble will feel like these two extremes. They are now they're just they're cra- we're sick of them. Just no no we, you know we're not gonna. Um, we're not going to go to those illiberal extremes as both sides are really, I mean, actual Nazis. I I can't believe I'm seeing this. Um, So there, there is a possibility of exhaustion. Uh, And then this is backed up by um, one really wonderful work by a British organization, more in common uh, that has done wonderful work in Britain and the United States, looking at the makeup of the electorate. And they find there are seven groups. If you do a cluster analysis of people's attitudes, there's seven groups. And, you know, the extreme groups are, are very extreme and are, everything's po- uh, politics, but there's a large group of 70 or 80%, uh, which they call the exhausted majority. And uh, it, it includes a lot of uh, two different groups on the left, along with centrists and along with people, a big group, the biggest group in America is people who just are apathetic, they're not political, they don't vote very much. Um, so the majority of Americans are already exhausted by this. Uh, social media has given the extremes a megaphone so it's, we're now even more sick of it. Um, so if someone, some movement, some coherent narrative, a moral narrative about who we are, why we got messed up, basically the founding fathers were right in the warnings they gave to us. We should have listened to them. Let's read them now. Um, I think there is the possibility of, I don't know whether it would be a centrist movement or, a, or exhausted, you know, these are not good names, exhausted majority movement. Um, you know, unfortunately, the, you know, the worst number of political parties to have in a country is one. And the second worst number is two. And that's what we have in America. So it's kind of hard for anyone to take that middle ground. Uh, but maybe it won't come in Congress. Maybe it won't come from the political class. But there could be, as you say, a movement of, of people that would, I hope would span that center line um, that says enough already. You know, the ship is sinking. Let's, you know, let's repair the ship. Um, so I'm not going to bet on that happening. But you know what? It's a lot more likely to happen now uh, than I would have thought four months ago. Well, that's a really hopeful thought on which to uh, end. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for uh, talking to me. If you want to know more about uh, Jonathan's work, then if you want to understand politics and society, I strongly recommend The Righteous Mind. But many of us are living at home, and that's giving us a chance to think about our lives and our future. So I also recommend The Happiness Hypothesis, a book that that changed my life, and which is a great book to read if you're thinking about how to get your life, if you want to think about how to get your life balance right uh, in these uh, times. And you can follow Jonathan uh, on Twitter. He's on uh, uh, at John Height. Um, So before we sign off, a quick reminder to everyone watching to stay tuned to the RSA's channels in the coming weeks for all the latest Bridges to the Future events and podcast announcements, as well as news from our policy research team and our 30,000 fellows around the world who make all of our work possible. Finally, thank you again to Jonathan Haidt and thank you all for watching.